Well, greetings. Nice to see you all. And if you are watching live and Facebook, always a joy to do these videos, although I don't do them as often as I would like. So please let me know where you're watching from. You can hear and see everything. And I am very interested to share this word with you because I believe this pertains to the times and seasons we are currently living in. And I don't know about you, I've nearly lived on the earth for 40 years. I'll be turning 40 this year. I have never lived in a time quite like this. And that's a good thing. You know, back in 2020, many of us who have lived for quite a long time could say, well, we've never experienced a time and a season quite like what we went through with all the rioting, political upheaval, and of course, COVID. But now here we are, I believe, on the brink, if not entering into a dramatic great awakening. And I am quite convinced, as Dutch Sheets often says, when you know what time it is, you know what to do. And providentially, as I'm recording this today, he had a very powerful Give Him 15 broadcast. You can catch that on YouTube, which reminds us what time it is in the spirit. So Allentown, Pennsylvania, Nashville. Wow, Qatar. Well, nice to see you all on. And again, I'm going to just share this brief video because I want to let you know what you can expect when you see the movie Jesus Revolution. No one's paying me to see this, to, to say these things. We all went together this week to see the movie. And I don't know about you, but as I sat through that movie, not only did I find myself weeping pretty continuously and regularly, but I found my heart burning. And I think of the apostles who were walking on the road to Emmaus with Jesus when they really were discussing after the fact, saying, did our not hearts burn when he shared the word, unveiled the word to us? And um, wow, you're at my, Asbury, Mike. Well, nice to see you all. Again, thank you for joining. I'm curious how many of you have seen the Jesus Revolution movie. Interestingly enough, a little backstory that you might not know about me. Before I got into ministry, one of the things that I really wanted to do was be a film journalist. So I have extensively studied film, cinema. That's what I actually got part of my degree in, in my undergrad. I got a bachelor's of arts in communications, thank the Lord, but also script, screenwriting, and film. So I had a real burning desire to see the kingdom of God impact mainline Hollywood. I, I, I was very not interested in joining the Christian film world. Not that I'm against it because they've actually stepped up their game significantly with this new movie, Jesus Revolution. But I wanted to do what I could to engage mainline Hollywood cinema, uh, be a film journalist, film reporter, recognizing this, that so many people, that is the pulpit that preaches to them not just movies, entertainment, media. Media is the pulpit that preaches to a generation, whether you and I like it or not. That is why the church needs to be vocal, loud, not obnoxious, not mean-spirited, but why the church needs to be bold when it comes to be a, dyna a, a dynamic force for truth-telling in the earth. If we don't do it, if the church does not do it, I can promise you, Hollywood is and the media is going, to, is going to continue to be loud, bold, and relentless, and intent on discipling a whole generation. So all that to say, that was my uh, passion back in that day. But here we are now, fast forward to this moment in history, and this movie has come out, Jesus Revolution, which I would dare say is probably one of the, if not the best, Christian film that has been made. It's very honest. I think it's very raw. It navigates things like uh, church hurt or uh, differences in ministry leaders. It, it navigates those things very sensitively uh, with great honor. I love how whether it's Chuck Smith or Lonnie Frisbee, both are exposed for some of the flaws that they navigated. Obviously, Lonnie Frisbee uh, ended poorly, but still was a real catalyst for revival. And the bottom line is it doesn't demonize anybody. It shows us the reality to the best a Hollywood film could 
of that particular moment in history. And what is the supernatural thing that happened when we saw the movie? I will tell you, is when we saw that movie, yes, there were tears. Yes, there was excitement. Yes, there was joy. But my heart burned because I actually felt like that movie released now, released at this moment in history, coupled with the Asbury revival outpouring, whatever we want to call it, what the Holy Spirit did at Asbury. Side note, I'm done having goofy conversations about rhetoric and language. Well, was it a revival? Was it an outpouring? And I think there's people who are making some good statements about what the Lord did there. But can we just celebrate that that God was moving? Can we celebrate that God was doing a unique work among next generation young adults? Can we just celebrate that, recognize that? Because to the degree that we don't recognize the activity of God, we will actually miss Great Awakening. It's possible for somebody to sleep through a Great Awakening. You got to hear that again. I don't like saying that, but it's true. It is possible for a believer, let alone parts of the church, to sleepwalk and to slumber through a Great Awakening. If it were not so, Jesus would not continually talk about how important it is. I'm thinking specifically in Luke chapter 12 about staying awake or being a people who keep our lamps burning and remain awake. Jesus even used the phrase at one point in the context, it was the Jewish community at the time actually missed their Messiah and they did not receive their day or their time of visitation. Jesus showed up on the scene, the ultimate awakening, the ultimate move of God, Jesus, son of God, God himself was there and they missed him and they actually missed their time of visitation. And my prayer for all of us is that we would recognize what is God doing right now. And that is the supernatural thing that I think happened in all of us when we saw the movie. Our hearts burned. And I felt like the film was a significant alarm in the spirit saying, it's time. I talk in my book, Pentecostal Fire, about seven alarm clocks that let us know what time it is in the spirit. I would dare say Jesus' revolution is an alarm clock in the spirit coupled with what happened in Asbury, coupled with what was taking place at all of these different schools and universities among young people, as it was in the days of Jesus' revolution, seems to be happening now. This is no publicity stunt. You could not arrange this. You could not manufacture this. God is on the move, and I want us all to be awake and engaged with what he is doing. That is the wonderful invitation of the Jesus revolution movie. And I want to encourage you, go in with expectation, go in with eyes open, go in with a heart that is postured to receive, because perhaps the greatest message that we all took away is, wow, the conditions that were prevalent in society around the time of the Jesus people movement, Jesus revolution, those conditions are very eerily similar to what our nation and the nations of the earth are experiencing right now, which means it is ripe. It is ripe for a move of God. We're seeing the stirrings. I actually believe we are witnessing the prayer thrust that precedes the outpouring of revival. If we're going to actually analyze what's happening right now, let's do it appropriately. And rather than get lost in words, let's recognize how things tend to happen on God's timeline. And I'll tell you exactly in maybe two verses what's happening right now. I think right now we're in Acts 2 verse 1 where it talks about they gathered together in one place and in one accord and left and right. What are we seeing? We're seeing people gathering together in one place and one accord. Is there preaching? Some places there is, some places there's not. There's prayer and worship. And can I be transparent with you? My heart got a little bit offended at one point. I recognized it was God. I'm just being totally candid with you. When I was observing Asbury, observing all these student awakenings, my heart got a little bit crusty, cynical. I don't know what the right word is because I was like, well, where's the gospel preaching? Which is a fair question. It is a fair question. Somebody needs to be preaching the gospel in a context of revival. Otherwise, I am quite convinced we are not having a full 
expression of revival and revival is really a return to what we see in the book of acts okay let's simplify however how so i was getting a little bit offended cynical i'm like well where's the preaching and yes i understand there was testimony and the sharing of scripture and repentance <clears throat> and i experienced some of it firsthand because i was there at Esbury. but here's what i felt like the lord said i felt like the lord said larry you need to recognize what's happening and identify it on my revival timetable and it was almost like the holy spirit saying you study this stuff, Larry. You study the timetables of revival. You should know full well, Larry, what's happening right now. And it was just like an anvil hit my head. Um, well, I don't know what, but it was like, wow, God, historically, as we see the time leading up to the demonstration, the full release of what we call revival or awakening, there was a period of prayer. There was that Acts 2, verse 1 period of time, really going back to Acts chapter 1, where they gathered together in a place of prayer, place of fellowship, and a place of contending, place of fervent prayer. It wasn't just, you know, que sera prayer. It was fervent prayer. There was the gathering together, fellowship, and prayer. I'm sure there was worship as well. I mean, we obviously see that in these meetings today. And then what happened? There was Acts 2 verse 1, which reminds us they were gathered together in one, in one place in one accord. And then there was Acts 2, verse 2, which followed, which is, and suddenly. And may I just end this video with this exciting prophetic announcement. I'm quite convinced we are escalating towards the inevitability of a suddenly outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As people have been gathering together in prayer, and we didn't witness this just this year. We've witnessed it now for a couple of years, actually, um, 2020. And then I think, of course, leading up to the presidential election with things like the return and all that. But I do see just right now everything from the Jesus Revolution movie to all the people who have been gathering together in prayer, particularly students. We are at Acts 2, verse 1, and we are quickly escalating towards the inevitability of Acts 2, verse 2. And suddenly, there was the mighty rushing wind. Suddenly, there was the dramatic, dynamic demonstration and the release of the Holy Spirit. I understand Pentecost was only once. I understand that that outpouring that took place 2,000 years ago, that outpouring is actually sufficient for today. What took place in that upper room 2,000 years ago is more than sufficient for you and I to benefit from that outpouring of the Holy Spirit to actually preach the gospel to all creature and disciple all nations. Isn't that amazing? That the outpouring of the Spirit that took place 2,000 years ago in that upper room was entirely sufficient, more than capable to endue you and I with the power to preach the gospel to every creature, see souls saved, and to disciple nations and see culture transformed. That outpouring was sufficient, but I will end with this thought. I will end with this biblical notion in that we had Pentecost, and Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 will be forever distinct. But then we had Acts chapter 4, where they were once again gathered together for prayer. And what happened? And they were filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, spoke the word with boldness, and literally the place where they met physical house, shaken. So let's just end this time in prayer. And I pray that you would go see the Jesus Revolution movie and that your heart would burn as you watch it, just like ours did. And say, Lord, this movie is one of those prophetic alarm clocks that let us know what time it is in the spirit. And I pray right now, Father, for your Holy Spirit outpouring. We thank you that we are moving, we are escalating towards a suddenly outpouring of the Spirit. We're already seeing it in measure. We are already seeing the signs. We are already seeing the indicator lights going off. We are hearing the alarm clock going off in the Spirit saying very clearly, it's time. And Father, we thank you right now in Jesus' name. And I'm seeing friends right now from Australia watching, friends from Houston. I just want you if you, if you don't mind, <clears throat> as we finish up, in the comments, and you can do this later on if you're not watching live, I want you to write your, your nation or your city and simply say, 
it's time for what? It's time for Houston. It's time for Australia. It's time for Europe. It's time for Arkansas. Whether it's the state, whether it's the city, whether it's the nation, whatever burns in your heart, because the Lord sometimes will give you a vision and a zeal. For yeah, come on, New Zealand. It's time, Father. We we whoa! I feel the Holy Ghost even right now. And listen, I'm not giving you this as some exercise to make me feel better because oh, there's people commenting and stuff. I want you to get that in your mouth, not just in the comment. And declare, God, it's time for Maryland. It's time for Idaho. It's time for Somebody just needs to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. I want to encourage you. I feel the Holy Spirit. It's all your fault, people. Because you're prophesying. It's time. Well, Larry, where does it say that in the Bible? I'll tell you where it says that in the Bible. Joel 2 and Acts 2 tell us what God's heart is. God's end time objective is that all flesh, that includes your city, that includes your state, that includes your nation. Well, I live in a hard place. Doesn't matter. Well, you don't know the sin. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as a hard place for the glory, and there's no such thing as a hard place for the gospel. Now, if you go in with gimmicks, and if you go in with some old, tired church handbook strategies, yeah, it's going to be hard. That will be a hard place. That statement, well, it's a hard place. It's a hard region. It's a hard territory. That is 100% true if you go into that place and try to offer them some man-concocted formula. But I prophesy even now, there is no such thing as a hard state, hard city, hard nation, hard geography for the glory, for the manifest presence of God coupled with the bold and clear presentation and preaching of the gospel. So, Father, we declare it's time. And I'm just quite convinced that people are going to gather together in churches and prayer meetings. We're going to see an uptick like that. If you see, if you think where we are right now is outstanding, that is going to go through the roof. And I'm convinced every time we come together, we are going to experience greater measures of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe we're going to see greater intensification of miracles. I believe it's going to increase and increase, but there's also going to be a push of the Lord for us to go outside of those gathering places and carry outpouring into the street, carry the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into whatever sphere of influence you're called to go to, because that's how the outpouring of the Holy Spirit actually impacts all flesh. All flesh can't fit in our meetings. All flesh can't fit in our buildings. But all flesh, you and I actually get to be part of impacting all flesh. I love it, Chelsea, what I hear God doing in Australia, Chelsea and uh, Daniel Hagen. It's amazing. God is on the move. We're going to be in Houston. Me, Tommy, and Miriam Evans are going to be in Houston, Texas, that has had such a flurry of prophetic words over it. We're going to be there this Sunday night at 5 p.m. at Rig Nation USA. You can look it up online, Rig Nation USA. We will be there in Houston. I think they're doing Greg, um, who is really the wonderful steward and shepherd over that community. He was watching, but uh, I, I believe they're doing five nights of revival. I'm quite convinced God's restoring protracted meetings. He is restoring extended meetings. We're going to be in gatherings and we are going to sense that, okay, God wants to keep this going, but here's the deal. I'm quite convinced the church will remain in revival, increase in revival, go from glory to glory, if, and this is a big if, we are willing to steward revival and carry revival outside of the meetings. In other words, we will see revival increase and intensify in our gatherings to the degree that we're willing to take and carry the spirit of revival to whatever spheres of influence we are called to go into. If you're in the political arena, if you're in media, arts and entertainment, if you're in banking, if you're in Walmart, if you're a stay-at-home mom, wherever you are, I'm quite convinced the eyes of the Lord are watching. Whoa. Watching and evaluating. People don't like to talk about this stuff, but God has the right to watch, evaluate, and judge. He is. God is judging what we are doing with revival. In these days ahead, he is going to judge communities, churches, gatherings, 
And when I say the word judge, he's going to evaluate what do we do with the spirit of revival? Is it all about us having meetings and having more people and having extended gatherings and identifying the success of revival based on how long and how often we met? If that becomes our standard, I'm convinced God at his own discretion could remove or back up on that spirit of revival. Why? Because his desire, remember, his desire is all flesh. But if we are intentional about discipling, raising up and deploying people to just carry that wonderful spirit of revival wherever they go, it will multiply. It will produce reformation because that's how reformation takes place in society is people who get touched by revival decide, I don't want to keep it in the confines of a church meeting. And pastoral leadership needs to recognize our objective is not to simply bring people to our meetings and identify success based on how good the meetings are and how long they last. If once again, that becomes our metric for success, God has the right to withdraw the intensity of his spirit. He has the right to sovereignly withhold increased measures of revival because we are not stewarding well. But I'm convinced we have yet to see a church that intentionally raises up and deploys revivalists to go into every sphere of influence and actually become reformers. Because when we see that, and as we see that, and just by the way, I think we're poised at this moment in history to see that maybe more than any other revival in the past, simply because of the teaching and the instruction we have on what it means to be a reformer and a change agent in society. If we intentionally do that, guess what? That wonderful glory presence of God will not only linger, not only increase and intensify in our gatherings, but it will go to levels, dimensions, and realms that perhaps we have never tasted since the book of Acts. And I believe God is raising up a church that will be compatible with his second coming. So I do encourage you, if you can make it out, Houston, Sunday night, this Sunday, I think it's March 5th, me, Tommy, and Miriam Evans will be having a night of revival with Greg Gervais and the amazing team at Rig Nation, R-I-G, Nation USA. It's in Houston. I don't have the address offhand, but you can look that up online or on Facebook, Rig Nation USA in Houston. And then lastly, please pray for me, please. I, I want to make sure, please, if you if you could kindly uphold me in prayer, that I would remain in uh, good health and strong. Uh, Next week, I will be going to Belfast, Ireland and ministering for some dear friends there, Rose and Kevin Sambrook, outstanding prophetic voices and pioneers in that nation. So I'll be in Belfast next week. And then after that, I will be teaching at the Bible College in Wales, uh, Reese Howells Bible College. And then while I'm there, I'm going to go to uh, Mariah Chapel, one of the key sites of the Great Welsh Revival, um, because I just believe the Lord is doing a lot right now. And I feel like he is setting up nations to experience this wonderful outpouring of the Spirit. So please pray for me. Otherwise, thank you. You guys are so kind. And I look forward to seeing you all very soon. And like I said, if you haven't seen Jesus' revolution yet, please go see it. You will be blessed.